All right, you want to hear something crazy? You may be struggling with weight loss because of bacteria. That's right. Your microbiome may be what's getting in the way of you and your fitness and health goals. No joke, studies show that bacteria play an integral part in fat loss and in the behaviors that can result in weight gain or fat loss. Literally, studies are showing this. It's pretty crazy stuff. Don't be a, a poopy gut. Yeah, wow, wow. That's a great <laughs> Or at least a healthy poopy gut. Let's make a t-shirt. This, this seed's going to love that yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a poopy gut. Do you know that? Okay, so do, do you guys remember when I first brought up these weird studies where they would do fecal transplants? Yeah. yeah. With the mice. So crazy. Okay. So for people who aren't familiar with these, these are, and they've repeated these, these studies in these animals. with humans, didn't they? At uh, one point. I, I don't know if they did these in humans. They might have. I, I've country. heard they had like de, like pills that Justin they volunteered. Taken, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I was going to sign up. Yeah, Anyways. Yeah. So they did, so in, in the animal studies, what they did is they took obese mice and they took lean mice. Yeah. And they literally did what's called a fecal transplant where they took the microbiome, in essence, of the lean mouse, put it in the obese mouse. And then the obese mouse got lean. And That's here, wild. Yes. It's crazy. Just simply doing that causes it to get lean. And then vice versa. The obese mouse, they took their bacteria, moved it to the lean mouse, and they gained body fat. I think the biggest takeaway from that is just highlights how little we know about what the gut is responsible for. I mean, we call it the second brain, right? Yeah. And it's And we still don't know everything it's com completely responsible for or what it could manipulate or do. We're I feel like we're still we're still learning so much in that department and it's crazy that it's not it's not talked about more in the health and fitness space, especially like in the like you know, body composition, bodybuilding, like that's, it started to on my way out, yeah. you started to hear more and more competitors like diving into it uh, a little bit more. But it, to me, I think there's uh, a, a lot to be said here on why somebody may or may not be losing weight or able to change their body composition yeah. because they have something going on. Well, in their gut. so here's what we do know, right? We do know, cause you're right. It's so complex. There's a, there's a very complex relationship between your microbiome and your body and your behaviors <laughs> and your metabolism and your hormones, pretty much everything. Cause we, we co-evolved with these bacteria. In fact, you probably have more bacteria cells than you do human cells. Okay. So in essence, I mean, I could literally say you're more bacteria than human, from a, a number of cell um, standpoint. But here's what we do know. We do know for a fact that obese individuals have a certain type of microbiome fingerprint and lean individuals have another one. Obese individuals tend to have less diverse microbiome uh, makeup than lean individuals. And we do know that when you take obese individuals and you give them uh, like bifido and lactobacillus type bacteria, these are the most common bacteria you'll find in probiotics, that they tend to have better insulin, better fasting glucose. And there are studies now that show that there may be some fat loss associated. And so people are like, well, what's causing the fat loss? Well, this is where it gets really weird. One, and the most obvious one is it, it influences your behaviors. Your microbiome can definitely influence your cravings, how much you eat, how much you don't want to eat. And that's obvious, right? If you want to eat less, you're going to eat less and you're going to get leaner. If you want to eat more, you'll eat more and gain body fat. But here's where it gets really weird. Your microbiome plays a, an important role in how food is broken down, how energy is utilized, how efficient you utilize energy, or, or how inefficient you are with energy use. Meaning, two individuals consuming the exact same calories could have vastly different results because their microbiome and the influence it has on how those calories are utilized and how their insulin uh, levels are and all that other stuff. So. It's really crazy stuff when you yeah. kind of break it down. I think this kind of points back to when we were talking about, um, you know, the majority of people are probably have some kind of gut issue, like in, in walking around blissfully ignorant with uh, whatever's going on in terms of like, you know, some of their body signals, uh, you know, and just kind of repeating the same patterns. And really like, there's a lot of influence like your gut bacteria, your microbiota has uh, on a lot of like cravings and decisions. And, you know, there's a lot more to it that I think like if, if people really take the time to peer into that and, and, and try to solve a lot of these issues, uh, their body's just going to work better. And then all of these other pursuits are going to happen 
happen more likely. Well, I've had, I don't know how many you guys have had, but I mean, God, we've been removed from training clients day to day for quite some time. So I imagine this is only worse, but I've had more than just a, a few handfuls of clients that I could not get to the bottom of why mm -hmm. we yeah. weren't losing weight. Exactly. And then they went and saw a specialist and found out that they had some serious gut issues and fixed that. And then all of a sudden they start <coughs> dropping weight. Yep. And so, I mean, how many people are potential? That's why I really don't like the oversimplification of calories in calories out movement. It's way our, too complex. It's way yeah. too complex than that. And it's way more nuanced. And it, even though that science still applies and <coughs> is in, in, in you, communicating man. that and getting somewhat of an understanding for the average person is important. It's not the end all be all. And the people that have done all the calorie counting and, and done and tried all these different diets and still can't figure out why they're not losing weight or their body isn't changing. Uh, many times it has something related to their gut, yeah. at, at least in my experience. And, and again, I've been removed from training day-to-day -day clients for a long time now. And I know it's only getting worse. I'll, look, here's my personal experience. This yeah. is just me. Okay. This is my personal experience because I I've dealt with, uh, on and off with gut issues for probably over 10 years now. And, uh, I've gotten a lot better with, uh, my gut health. And for me, I've already, I've got it down to the number. My, when my gut is off versus when my gut is much better, the difference for me is 10 pounds of lean body mass mm -hmm. and about 3% body fat. That's, that's huge. That's massive. Yeah. That is massive. When my gut is off versus when it's on, I'm a different person in how I react to exercise, mm -hmm. uh, how I feel emotionally, um, how I view the world, um, you know, my inflammation, like pretty much everything. We used to think that the brain had no connection to any of this stuff because the brain is like this sterile place. If you get bacteria in the brain, that's a bad thing. We now know there's something called the gut brain axis. They communicate very closely. The gut and the brain communicate very closely. So we now have studies to show that supplementing with things like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium and others can reduce anxiety, reduce depression, improve feelings of confidence, reduce C reactive protein. Um, I mean, it's, crazy. That's how important it is. And you mentioned it, it was the second gut. Um, that's where we produce a lot of our second serotonin. Brain. It's where we have the second highest amount of serotonin receptors. This is why you feel things in your gut. It's so strange too, by the way. I was just going to say that. I love when my favorite part about this is when things connect back to like old wisdom. Isn't that weird? Yeah. You know, it's like, we've been saying that, oh, I feel trust it in your gut. Yeah, yeah. Trust your gut or I feel it in my gut. Like, you know, like yeah. there's been follow this. Follow your heart. That's another place. That's the serotonin. third highest concentration of those receptors. It, it goes yeah. brain, gut, heart. I mean, these are all the places we talk about feeling And things. people have been saying that forever. And yet we've just now kind of made this connection, like, which is again, also like, you know, how how much further are we going to go before we connect the dots on something else that we had no idea about that there was like old wisdom that's been telling us this? Well, what's for. what's weird to me is it's easy for us to conceptualize things that we think because the brain also has consciousness that we're aware of. But when you look at at the heart and the gut from a receptor standpoint, there's a knowing that comes from those two areas as well. It's more of a behind the scenes subconscious knowing. This is where that terminology comes from. Mm -hmm. I feel it in my heart or why the heart is associated with love, huh? This is an organ that pumps blood. Why does the heart mean love? Why do we feel things that, why do we feel things in our gut when we're nervous or scared? We get those butterflies or, you know, mentioning I feel it in my gut when it comes to intuition. Nobody talks about intuition coming from their brain. Like, oh, I just, my brain is telling me something's off. They'll go in a room and they'll be like, yeah, let's get out of here. Why? I don't know. I feel it in my gut. Something's off yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's very interesting and very strange. And we've known this for thousands and thousands of years. Finally, science is catching up. And if you're trying to become more fit and healthy and you don't pay attention to these things, it will be almost impossible. It will literally be almost impossible. Talk to anybody with really bad gut issues and they'll tell you, like, you ain't, you ain't going anywhere until you solve that. You're not going to build muscle. You're not going to get stronger. You're not going to burn body fat if your gut is off. Now, it's true that it's super complex. But we do know that there are certain bacteria that seem to be beneficial in most people. I named both of them, but there's variances in, in, in both of those. And the kind of probiotic you use, if you use a probiotic, makes a difference. Now, mm -hmm. studies show that even dead probiotic type beneficial bacteria seem to have a benefit. Um, so even if they're not alive, there seems to be some benefit. It probably has to do with offsetting maybe 
other type of bacteria in the gut, or there may be some signaling that's going on. But it seems, well, it doesn't seem the most of the benefit comes from live bacteria. And even more benefit comes from that bacteria being delivered to the places that they need to be delivered because yeah. consuming bacteria straight in the mouth oftentimes gets destroyed in the gut. Well, that's where a lot of the uh, other brand probiotics sort of fail, right? Yeah. Is the delivery process. So it doesn't really end up getting to where it needs to go. And, uh, you know, the the stomach sort of does its thing and, and dissolves most of it. So. What I used to think was, this is what I, early on when I was learning about this, they would say, buy refrigerated probiotics because then the bacteria is alive. If it's on the shelf, it's going to be dead. And so then that's what I would do. And then I learned, like, I remember I was talking to a functional medicine practice was years ago and he said, yeah, that's not great either. I said, why? And he goes, well, are you refrigerated? Like you're going to eat it. It's going to die so quickly as it goes through your system. So it's better than nothing, but it's still not great. Well, now we have technology where they can deliver stable room temperature bacteria in capsules designed to go through the digestive process like food to release the bacteria where it's supposed to. So we work with a company called Seed. They're the most advanced company when it comes to probiotics. They actually have a massive gut simulating machine where you can put the capsule in and you can see what happens to the capsule. You can capture where the bacteria come out. Are they alive? Are they dead? To my knowledge, they're the only company that does this. And yeah. this is why we chose to work with them. In fact, I've taken... I've probably taken over 25 different probiotic brands. This one is the one that I've used the most consistently that has produced the best uh, results for me. But nonetheless, if the bacteria is beneficial and it's in a capsule, you're going to get some benefit for most people. And probiotic supplements are not expensive. They have such wide ranging benefits that, by the way, unless you're, you're dealing with some kind of bacterial overgrowth and your functional med medicine practitioner advises you not to take a probiotic because there mm -hmm. are cases where you don't want to take extra bacteria, Besides those people, um, it's probably the one supplement that everybody should supplement with in some form or capacity, including children. I give specific types of probiotics to my baby, my baby children, my nine-month-old and my two-and-a-half-year-old because the data is showing just how beneficial it is. I was going to ask you the next time we actually were going to be talking about seed was, do you recommend, I'm, I've I admittedly said that I've been really inconsistent with, with my probiotic and I know I should be better. And right now I'm on this kick because of Dr. Cabral and I've been, you know, I don't know what you call it, detoxing or cutting, cutting out dairy, whatever out of my diet. Uh, do you think it would be smart for me to be consistent yeah. with taking that right now? Also, should I wait for the 21 days? To so I was going to tell you this morning, but I want to save it for this episode. Um, so remember how you said you've gone off dairy and then you had a little bit of it and you got this huge flare up. Yeah. What may be happening is this, uh, your microbiome adjusts according to the food that you consume. Okay. And what might've happened is you might've developed some sort of a, a bit of a protective microbiome makeup to the dairy you were consuming. So you still had intolerance, right? but the bacteria that breaks it down was living off of it. And so you got some, some benefit, you got some protection. You stopped consuming the dairy, got microbiome changed. Now you're even more sensitive. So yes, I think- uh, taking seed every single night consistently will probably help okay. with that whole process okay. and just bolst bolster your gut health. I overall, just didn't yeah. know if I should do that because it would skew potentially. No. Out. Okay. So it, no. it's only unless you're specifically told not to take. So when I had really bad SIBO, yeah. uh, I was told don't want to populate anything. Don't take anything yet. Yeah. Let's That's wait. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Let's wait till, <laughs> let's wait till we get a yeah. little better and then start taking it. Shave that down for a while. Yeah. But yeah. it depends on the individual and, and what they find in your SIBO test or whatever. So. But generally speaking, most people, yeah. that's like like a multivitamin almost like it should be something that it's a regular. Dude, it's such a- it It's makes, healthy bacteria you're populating your gut with. It can't be bad. Totally. And the problem is this, is that with, with probiotics, in extreme cases, people will notice the benefit. They're like, oh my God, I'm not constipated anymore. Or, wow, my heartburn is better. Or, you know, my diarrhea is a lot better, right? Uh, or bloating is a lot better. So these, these, these like big outward symptoms. But there's these lower level symptoms that people, unless they're really paying attention to, aren't super perceptible. It's like when you used to train a client mm -hmm. and then you would point something out and they'd go, oh yeah, like I do notice that. Yeah. So what I recommend to people is if you're not taking a good probiotic, go with a good one. Obviously we, we recommend seed. And start paying attention to things that aren't so obvious, like mood, sleep. Ask your partner if they're honest with you. Hey, have you noticed any differences in, in my mood and my attitude? Pay attention to inflammation, stiffness, uh, your skin, your hair, 
Um, all the all the things that you might not necessarily notice unless you're really paying attention, and you'll probably notice some some benefits. Okay. You'll probably notice that you know things are working out. But it's crazy. This is a really really crazy uh, area of study, and at some point, you know, this is just going off on a little tangent. At some point, they're probably going to be able to um, create a individualized, you know probiotic for you and a specific moment for whatever you're suffering from. Oh, yeah. We're, um, we're far away from that. It would take AI, I think, to figure awesome. that out. Uh-huh. But at some point, like this, this, the promise of this is pretty uh, remarkable. Well, I remember when we first started working with him, and maybe I keep forgetting to look this up because I was talking to uh, my cousin who's asked me about the probiotics and like what seed being so great. They, I remember, uh, who was it that we had on our show that re- was representing them when we first started years ago with them? And he was sharing like the 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 team they have yeah. are like the world's best yeah the world's leaders, best yeah. leaders in this space are all collaborating and working on on this company so yeah no they're like they're ahead of everybody in in that space totally. so you can find maybe another probiotic that is you know good but if you want the best and know you're getting the best like they yeah. literally have the what the happens best to me on. oh there they are there's right the there. team right there wow look at that we'll make sure we put that in the in the edited video. What, what, what I noticed with probiotics, I've worked with a lot of companies, um, or I've taken, I should say, a lot of different brands, is that some of them give me no benefit. Some of them give me benefit, but then I have to go off of them at some point for, for whatever reason. Hmm. Like I'll take them for a while, and then I'll start to kind of get negative effects, and then I'll have to switch to something else or go off for a while. Seed is the only one that I've taken now, I don't know, how long have we been with them? Three years? Yeah. That I've taken consistently every single night, empty stomach, right before bed. And um, it's just good every single time. I take no other probiotic, and I wouldn't even go back to any other probiotic. Nothing's had that kind of a benefit. Yeah, so. yeah. All right, today's program giveaway is Maps Strong. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel, and also turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. Also, we got some sales going on. Maps Symmetry, half off. The RGB Bundle, half off. If you're interested in either one or both, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. All right, so I want to uh, give you guys a little update on uh, my ketamine therapy. Oh, another, good. I've been waiting to ask you. Did another session yesterday. Well, that was last night, right? It was last night. Um, another, it, another crazy epiphany? Bro, it's this is cr- it's groundbreaking. You know you're gay now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I already knew that. Yeah. When I met you guys, I was like, man, these guys are, what is this feeling? I can always tell by the way you looked at me, you know what I'm saying? I knew it. <laughs> Something said, like that. Yeah. I don't see gender. I just yeah, yeah. see people. Oh, I'm such a good person. Yeah. Wow. Um, no, that's You're not so what happened. so evolved. That's yeah. not what happened. Can you imagine I come up to my wife? Yeah. Uh, honey, I had some good news and bad news. <laughs> What's the good news? I had a breakthrough. What's the bad news? <laughs> I got to divorce you. No, that's not what happened. So um, the data and the studies on ketamine are are crazy, Okay. So I want to start there. I've said this before, but like there was one study that showed that people would do, I want to say one treatment a month. uh, I think it was like an eight month period. And they were, these were people with treatment resistant depression, treatment resistant depression in the world of uh, therapy, psychotherapy, you know, medications like SSRIs or whatever. Like these are people that you just, you can't do anything about. Like all you can do is help them numb and live in the world. Treatment resistant depression is like uh, having terminal cancer. It's like the doctors are there and like, okay, we're gonna make you comfortable while you die or whatever. It's like one of the hardest things to treat. Same thing with Mm. extreme cases of PTSD. Like they're just, it's like, okay, we're gonna teach you how to cope with this, I guess, in the world. Well, the study showed um, 50% cured, okay? Cured. They never use that word for depression. There's never, they never say in any study. It's always like improves. Yes. Yeah. Cured, gone. It was gone. They didn't have depression anymore. 80% had substantial symptom relief. So a majority of people saw tremendous benefits. Half were totally cured. And the cure or the symptom relief, they tested six months after. So they stopped the treatment six months after, stuck around. Mm. So we're talking about. Wow. Yeah. And this is why ketamine was FDA approved. We're talking about. Uh, a, a breakthrough like we haven't seen in the treatment now, of some of these things. H- how hard is it for the average person to find a resource like this? Cause it's not, it's not like I drive around and I see clinics that they're are exploding. Are they? They're exploding. Yeah. So do you see it like, like opening up like clinics, like similar to like, you know, cannabis and TRT and what it's, we've seen at the, like this that? This is like, I mean, for people who are, 
for business investors and angel investors like this, I mean, I'm looking into this because I, I can't believe mm. um, the impact. And when you look at the studies, it's crazy enough. I, now I'm experiencing it myself. Is every state? It's FDA approved for the whole country. The whole country. Yeah, I don't know how. So this isn't like psil psilocybin's no. only moved in certain no, counties. No, this is, this, is, this is federally approved. Interesting. I wonder why, what do you, do you know why? Uh, because I've, I've heard similar positive benefits of doing therapy on psilocybin, MDMA, and now, and now ketamine. Yeah. So psilocybin, MDMA were never uh, federally approved drugs. They were, they were on the scheduled list. There's a lot of loot. There's a lot of regulations and stuff to get through. They have a stigma behind them, right? Magic mushrooms or party drug. Ketamine was already approved as a, a um, Tranquilizer. Okay. So it was already there as an approved drug. Mm. So that's probably why. I think the other reason why is it's not a classic psychedelic in the sense that like you take some psilocybin, you might see some stuff. Yeah, you might hallucinate a little maybe, bit. Maybe, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, MDMA at one point was used for therapy. I think that'll that'll probably be the next. I mean, in my opinion, that'll probably be one of the, the next ones to, to come out because that one I think has more, po like people tend to not have negative experiences with that. I think that's my own personal experience. But ketamine was the first one. Ketamine is not a classic psychedelic. It's called a disassociative. Um, it radically improves neuroplasticity, radically. So like if you want to learn something or change how you think about things, in the week um, following ketamine therapy, that's when you need to do it. And you should probably, and I was informed of this, but I've read more about this, you should probably avoid things that you don't want to model your brain. So you probably should avoid doing shit like being on social media too much or watching bullshit TV or- Because it'll like signify it. It could, oh, right? It could go in either direction. So it's like mm. you're in this like hyper plastic state. So was there, those. okay, so then based off of that, were there like a, a protocol you were supposed to follow leading up into it then? So you- to make sure that didn't happen or well, did you, they, did you they, just they, learn that off of your own research? This is what the therapist communicates with you and says, hey, you know, you probably don't want to go- get into a bunch of arguments or go stuck in traffic and get super pissed off and probably want to feed yourself things that you want. Think that you're shaping your brain. So whatever you're consuming, be aware of, of what you're consuming because hmm. you can really take advantage of this hyperplastic state. Is That hmm. was really what it was. Because it lasts for, it's like two or three, maybe even four weeks of hyperplasticity after one session. Okay. Interesting. So is it almost like it's... Um reversing the age of the brain, like bringing you back to like childhood when you're, when your brain is super. I mean, I guess that would probably be a, a fair comparison. I don't know if it goes that far. Like, I don't think I can learn a language and not have an accent type of deal. But I mean, based off of that, you would, it sounds like that would almost be like a similar. A, yeah. And, and also if you were going to learn a language, like there would be yeah. some benefit to well, that. So before. here's the other side of it. Cause someone might be like, Oh crap, that's kind of scary. What if, uh, whatever it, it makes you, um, non-reactive and calm. So let's say you do have a stressful event two or three days after your, your ketamine session, you're less likely to have this extreme reaction, which then could model the brain. You're more likely to handle it in a way where you're calm and you can see kind of what's happening, not take things personal. That will positively shape your brain. So let's just say, for example, give an example. Let's say you and your partner you guys get in this same argument all the time. Every couple has this, right? Every couple has those, those, I don't know what they call them. Like these, uh, like these, these arguments that are just repeated and you kind of have to accept them. Right. And they, tr they trigger you. So you get home, your wife is like, you did this thing again. And you're immediately pissed off. Cause we've talked about this, you know, 50 times in a row. She's mad. You're mad. And she set each other off type of deal. Well, now in this particular state, you go home, she's mad at you. You don't take a personal. And you're like, well, okay, I see what's happening here. And it makes her feel this way because of this. And here's what's happening for me. So now your brain can model itself after that experience. And now you become less reactive to things that might've triggered you before. And everybody has triggers, right? Some people it's money. Some people it's, you know, spending time with other people or, you know, maybe someone yell, whatever, right? So it improves or increases the odds that you're going to have positive modeling for the weeks that follow. I mean, this is exactly how I try and explain my experience that I had with Katrina on the psilocybin. I mean, this is like, we had a break to what, what you're explaining. Like you can is like, hear each other. You have an, you have an area where, you know, we've been together for 13 years, but there's, there's a couple things that we just, 
we don't see eye to eye on. We see you differently. Just get stuck. Yeah, we're, mm -hmm. and and so you know we've learned to navigate through that or avoid that conversation, or we know that the other partner is sensitive when that subject comes up. So we've learned to make it through those things, and we're okay. But never have we ever felt like one has truly understood the other person or, or agreed ever on, on that area. When we had that breakthrough, that was it. It was like for the first time, and she literally said those words, like, I see you, I understand, I get it now. Like, I don't, I, this whole time, I could never connect the dots on like the way you thought about this for mm -hmm. the first time I understand. It. And then now going forward, anytime that subject comes up, like it doesn't, it's never a, ever it's not a, the same. It's not the same anymore because she now is like ultra sensitive to how I process and think that's that scenario because she now sees it from my perspective and I to hers. Right. So we mutually had this experience like that. So I, I don't know how to break that down scientifically. What's, so what's happening. We, I know what you mean. Cause I, I've experienced that now. I think it's hard to understand unless you experience it and in, in what that feels like. But um, it's pretty wild. I know for me, each session has been different, which is wild. You would think it'd be the same experience. It's not. It's different each time. And each time is very valuable. I had one that was really hard. I had another one that was uh, more like about joyful. gratitude. Yeah, yeah. Then this other one that I just had, uh, I had all these, like I became, uh, my, my awareness around certain events became more broad and complete, which is mind blowing. I didn't realize, I mean, I, I might've, I mean, I guess logically I could have understood this, but you don't really know it until you experience it. When things happen to you as a child, a pivotal, pivotal moments, you tend to compress them in a timeline. You tend to forget certain events, not make certain connections. You make certain assumptions. That's your belief. And you never question it because you don't even know to question it. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh, that's what happened. Oh yeah. That's what happened. This is, this is how it is. When I went into the session, you know, there were certain things that happened as a, as a child for me. And then I realized the time frame. I thought the time frame was much shorter than it was. And I was like, oh, no, no, this happened over the course of two years. And this is how it started. This is how it ended. Now, how, okay, how do you confirm that? That's confusing to me. Because so you remember. Oh, so like all of a sudden you were having yes. like vivid memories of. You're there. Oh, wow. That's you fascinating. remember. You remember and you process. And then you be, you know why? Okay. So this is the best way I can explain it. You, your brain, your, your mind protects you, um, and, or creates, um, coping mechanisms that become a part of who you are and it becomes your operating system. Yeah. You, it just is. Just well, this explains so the, th the theory on why we tend to do this, like with you know, dark times or, or trauma that's happened right. in my life. It's like, it's a, it's black. Correct. You know, like I have a lot of space in my- You don't remember. Just don't remember anything yep. because yep. I've, my brain is almost like pruned it off because it's like, eh, it's better that we don't even think or it's, know about that. It's a survival <laughs> mechanism. Yeah, I was gonna say, so does this prove then that, you know, you don't really delete your memories. That's right. Right, they're in there somewhere in, in terms of being stored, but you're just protecting yourself from the the harm of it or or the uh, perceived sort of harm. Do of you it. know to that point? Did you know that I read this study the other day that uh, if you are if you've had trauma in your life, you're 50 percent more likely to have an autoimmune issue. Prob oh yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Oh yeah. So to that, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. So I've had this trauma stored it somewhere, so it's affecting the body mm -hmm. even, potentially even externally, like in my case with likes, but. You, isn't well, that wild? Again, to old wisdom, this is like what a lot of people talk about, like where, you know, you're storing a lot of these memories in your body. Correct. In certain places. Yes. And like, you know, if it's certain traumas, like, I, I don't know, I've heard people describe it in a lot of different ways. With oh, like that's Katrina, chakras. Katrina, yeah. Katrina's family believes that. Like, that's what, what she'll be massaging. And they'll feel like, and oh, they'll, they, they is, have yeah. areas of the body that are connected where to. your abandonment is oh, all this is your, this yes. is whatever. It's this like is crazy. The, your feminine side, your male side. This is family. Family, this is work. This is, and they all mean different things on where where you're. All of them it. are designed. All of these mechanisms are designed to keep you moving forward in life and to procreate. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to move forward in life and operate optimally, but they are there to protect you. Hmm. And so, what happens is, if you if you your mind, your body doesn't feel safe going back and retraining or changing or processing these types of um, emotions or experiences, not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You could do all the therapy you want. You could try all you want. And unless you feel, unless your body is prepared, it's like, it's like training a new movement pattern. 
good luck creating a new movement pattern when their right. body it feels unsafe going into a move pattern. You can't. You literally have to have a trainer move you the right way for mm -hmm. it to happen. We know this. You'd have yeah. to like manipulate someone's body. This is where you're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And then it's like this big, well, you can't do that with your, with your mind. You can't do that with your, you know, your behaviors. It's uh, much more challenging. So what ketamine does is you ever have a moment where you can, you feel like you could step outside and look at yourself like someone else. And then mm -hmm. you go, Oh shit, that's what's, mm -hmm. I, we, I think we kind of experience that podcasting, right? Cause you record yourself. Then you listen to the podcast. Like, oh, should I do that? Yeah. yeah. And you hear yourself <laughs> yeah. and like, Oh, okay. That's what I sound like. And so it's kind of like that, but like times a billion. <laughs> so I was able to step outside. So what happens is because you disassociate, you can step outside, revisit these things and those protection me mechanisms don't need to be there as much. So I was able to look at the timeline. I was able to see what was happening. I was able to see the other person's perspective. I was asking questions. I realized like this thing, you know, these, these events that I thought were not that big of a deal were actually probably a big deal because otherwise why would I have blocked it out or why would I have thought of it in this way? And it's, and so, and the processing doesn't just happen there. It continues for the following days. You could feel yourself changing as you continue doing it. Almost it's, like you're continuing to unpack. It's not just unpack, but um, it's like a cycle that has to happen and you stop the cycle at some point, then you can get it moving again. And so you got to go. So someone may go, they may, so extreme trauma, I haven't had extreme trauma, but someone with extreme trauma may be able to visit it, process it. And then for the following week, go through the stages of dealing with that trauma where hmm. they get elated or they feel sad or they're tired. Literally it's going through their body and then they come out the other end and it's like, wow, I, I could, so like I was talking to, to somebody who had developed extreme anxiety over flying, mm. just they got on a plane, they'd freak out. They'd have to drug themselves to get on the plane. Otherwise they couldn't travel anywhere. After two ketamine sessions, gone. Completely. G gone. Get on the plane, they're fine. And they don't even need like exposure Nothing. therapy or anything Nothing. to coincide with that. Wow. That's like the hard way to do it essentially. Right. right. So. Like you would like take small doses of exposure. Yeah, and just learn how to kind of yeah. grit your teeth and, and go through it. This, like the, the person's like, oh yeah, it was totally gone. So huh. uh, um, what have been the time periods of your life that you've gone back to now? So are, are they all the same no. time period? Like what was this last one? What age? Teenage, young teenage, early, like late adolescence, early teenage. Some of the other ones were where I was like four or, wow. you know, seven, um, you know, and then you, you, you end up you see very distinctly, or at least I did very clearly and distinctly, you know, where some of my belief patterns or behavior patterns come from, why some things can seem so, you know, all of us do this, right? All of us have some things that just seem impossible. Other people seem to be able to do it. But for me, it just drives me crazy. Like, for example, this isn't one that I, I figured out with the therapy. Maybe I will, I don't know. But scheduling stuff, it set, it drives me up the wall. I hate it. I hate it. I hate having to schedule things. I hate people telling me you got to do this at this time. That time it's just overwhelming and it drives me crazy. There's probably a route to it because other people have no, no problem with it. Some people may feel like that in a crowd or when people look at them in the eyes or if they hear someone's voice raise or maybe just around men or just around people that look a particular way. And, um, this helps you move back and literally rewrite the program. It's like you're going in it's like you got a shitty computer program and you're an engineer and you go in and you oh there's the bug and then you fix it obviously not that simple but now have you had something that has radically changed a belief or behavior of yours oh yeah really oh yeah for sure i mean 100 percent. i mean I, I there are things that can set me off in my relationship with my wife that um i, I they definitely set me off i know they set me off but i couldn't really understand I thought I did, but I couldn't really understand why. And now, and I was taking it personal is what was happening. And now I don't. Mm. And so now I can hear what's going on and I can be the partner for this. I can be the other side. And, um, it totally changed everything because otherwise what happened is, you know, I'd set me off and that would set her off and then it'd become this whatever and a very different, um, experience. Do you I, put the, do you put the salt away now? The one, <laughs> that's not the one. 
<laughs> Are you still hell out I don't in the morning? Think, hey, listen. I don't know if that'll ever change. Dude. I'm hoping some of this shit will benefit me, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, all of a sudden, mouth closed. All of a sudden we don't, I don't need five assistants reminding yeah, me of yeah, everything yeah, that yeah, I had to dude. do. When's this Sour shit going to benefit me, man? I know. <laughs> hey, look, I'm telling you guys, dude, I uh, to the point where this is only a third time, I'm like looking into like figuring out how I can invest in something like this. That's how uh, remarkable it is. So. Well, it just seems like it'd be a great offering for like the VA or like to help out vets or somebody, you know, that's like why the government PTSD. That's why the government funded these studies. Yeah. Because so many soldiers were coming back and dying from suicide. It's just crazy. The numbers yeah. of yeah suicides has been happening. Yeah. More, more soldiers die from suicide than they do from, uh, from war. And so the government was that's crazy when you think about that. Yeah. Stuff. It's, it's and that's awful, sad. Man. Yeah. It's really you know, sad. the biggest, you know, where some of the craziest PT PTSD comes from, we automatically think people in the field, on the battlefield, which is obvious. Mm. Do you know where they get some PTSD, some people? Drone operators. Drone, I was going to say. Yeah. Oh, because I've heard guilt, that. probably, right? Well, well and the, what, did, what have you heard? Because well, I, yeah, I read a bunch of articles on it going down this rabbit hole. Yeah, I don't know if like, because originally you thought that like because they're removed from it, that it would be less uh, impact. But yeah, I've heard that they've actually, it, it's because they know that it, like all of this like has potentially affected people and even innocent people like you know they internalize it a lot more yeah so it took a, yeah so what i read was um there yes that plus it's like you go to the office all right honey i'm going to work uh, yeah. you go to work you fly a drone you kill 15 terrorists or whoever bad guys and you see them on your 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 drone camera you shred them you go back home to your kids like nothing happened mm. that having to switch back and forth Mm. Uh, is causing a lot of problems in mm -hmm. people uh, mentally. I can't imagine. Imagine going to work every day, killing someone, going back home. No, what that I, would be like on a daily basis. No, I can't. You I mean, I've mean? never been able to really imagine. It would almost my, be easier to do it. Like, I've never been able to even imagine myself as a soldier. I mean, I remember as a young kid, there was a time where I, I actually considered even doing that. But when I think as an adult now, like, you know, if I actually had to go to war and I was doing that, like, I don't know. I have to. Uh, You'd have to become someone else. Per yeah, 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 I would. I Otherwise, like, now. like I feel like uh, in a in a self defense, I I, I could see myself sure. killing or sure. or you know protecting like my but to like actively pursue war or like an encounter like that like that that's hard for me to even wrap my brain around that like okay we're gonna fly over come yeah. after these people fire kill like that's different like it's different than if someone was coming after me and it's like my i have to yeah. save my yeah. life or save my wife and child life i've heard that like special operators like they have less uh ptsd because they're like actively pursuing you know the bad guys and like you know, and they know who they're people. going yeah. after they know they're like the shepherding in, in a sense instead of like having it sort of I, I, I think there's probably a little bit of a self-selection bias there too also though. sure right yeah. right like you like these the people, people that, that don't have a problem with it that are kind of trained they know how to compartmentalize that's right they know how to yeah so exactly so there's, that off. there's probably more to do with that, I would think that that's a very special breed of person that actually makes it to that they, level. They theorize yeah. that because uh, men tend to do this really well. They tend to compartmentalize really well. This is why you know women will say you're emotionally unavailable or you know whatever. And they think this has to do with war. That there's this evolutionary process that happened because men were the ones that waged war. I mean, we could die, and the tribe will be okay if there's enough men to procreate. Right? You kill women and children, fuck. Right? So men probably evolved with the ability to compartmentalize so they could do that. By the way, that's not a great way to live in the world, to compartmentalize everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you become like a, a, like a robot. But I have a, I mean, this is sad, but I knew somebody whose dad fought in, uh, I think it was, I want to say Vietnam, and they lit up a, I don't remember what it was. There was, you know, a bunch of soldiers they were fighting and they, they you know, killed them all. And then they walk over to see what happened. And he found uh, one of the soldiers had pictures of his kids and it fucked him up because he was a father too. So he saw like, oh my oh, God, wow. I just killed the father. Yeah. Makes and it, it like totally real. destroyed him. Yeah. And he yeah. had a really tough, became alcoholic and the, the whole deal. So the government is very, has a strong incentive to figure this out because the traditional treatments of talk therapy, SSRIs, enzeolytics, like you're just numbing yeah. these people. They can't, it's hard for them to stay married. It's hard for them to function in the real world. Some of these guys are so like they they become this so much that they can't do anything else. Yeah. So they leave the military and then they go become hired, you know, private military and they go overseas to fu continue fighting because they can't do anything else. Why do you think it's not making as much uh, noise as it should be? I feel like I have read articles, but they're here and there. 
Um, you know how much money there is in war? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. The, the ketamine side. Oh, oh, oh. Like, why, why, why is it not like everywhere? You would think something so breakthrough. The pharma industry. Pharma industry. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's profit what, from ketamine. That's what, yes. I'm, that's what I'm leading that's to, what right? Is. Like, is is it because it's not patented and there's not like, oh. You get ketamine from a, from a compounding pharmacy. The money that you spend. That's you, so fucking sad. I know. Dude. The money yeah. you put. Look, it's, it's, it's the plus and minuses of markets. The plus side is there's profit motive and it drives innovation. The minus side is. There's low profits. There's there's very low innovation. Yeah, if innovation. We, if 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 pharma wasn't responsible for seventy percent of all advertising basically in the United States, and it was just everything was you know an even playing field for drugs, the stuff like this that was getting the that was getting the best yeah. results, it'd be more a merit of it, right? Like, yeah, oh, what's it would the be, most effective? I'm, that's right. That's it would be talked about all the time. I'm telling you right now, if the U.S. government did not have an incentive to figure out this whole issue with the military and when they come back and the PTSD and stuff like that, this wouldn't happen. Ketamine therapy would not exist right now. That's what's funding and pushing all of this is that because they are losing money, they're losing soldiers and yeah. it's hard to get people to enlist in the military. It's, it's really hard to recruit right now. When people become more and more aware of like how, what happens when you go off to war or you come home and that kind of stuff. So, because look, ketamine is produced in a compound pharmacy. It is generic. So it's not huge. You know where the money is in ketamine? In the like where you make money? It's in the therapists. True. And in these, but it's not the drug. So yeah. pharma isn't making tons of money selling ketamine. It's the therapists and stuff that administer it and work with people. That's where some of the money is involved. Like I know mm -hmm. how much I spend on this. I don't want to say what it is because, um, you know, I don't know if I can. But it's it's not the ketamine that's costing the money. It's the working with the therapists and stuff. Right. That costs the money. So, I which is know. like most things, right? I think that's, I mean, that, and we tend to recommend people always to go through like a professional with them. It's just like what we talk about, even like TRT, right? You could go get testosterone for pretty cheap, you know, if yes. you just go buy it on the street or buy it from some place. Right, like, right. but I mean, you're, you're working with someone who knows how to monitor. Yeah. It's, there's certain things that it's, you know, you could cut corners to save a little bit of money, but there's certain things that I think you 100% should spend the extra dime on. That would be something the same way. Totally. Too. All right. So, um, how I want to update on eight sleep. I, I, I know you guys are, are you especially are I am like so in love with this product. <laughs> like, and I, I always want to be careful, like the way I talk about it, because I don't want, um, I have, I don't have anything bad to say per se about Uller and, and chili, chili pad or whatever the fuck their company's name now. Um, I, that, that product was one of my favorite products that we ever worked with and it was great, but I, it's, eight sleep is just on a whole other level. Is there a big price difference? A little them? bit. Okay. It's a little bit more money. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, but here's the thing. And here's, this is how I sell it to all my friends, right? That, Cause they're like, Oh wow, that's expensive. And I was talking to Doug off air about this. Cause we knew eight sleep <clears throat> was today's uh, commercial and him and I was asking him how his experience was. You said what, 70, what? I keep my uh, house at 78 at night. 78. He can because of his, your eight sleep. Because yeah, eight sleep. unless Brianna's staying with me, then I will turn it down. But yeah, no, no, you're, normally, normally, what would you put it at? I mean, like you know, keep it around seventy, I suppose. So eight degree difference. Yeah, that's so got to save I you keep, money. I keep uh, totally. mine. Yeah, that's so. That's Dude, how I sell it to my friends. That go, it's expensive. I go, do the math and on what your AC run, what it costs you to run your AC to keep a certain temperature for a month in the summer, then multiply that by three, four months that wow. it's got to run. Yeah. And I guarantee you, if not within the first year, by year two, you've recouped your money back. I, I have to, I used to have to keep my house at night. 65 to 67 is what I have to keep where I can't, I can't sleep. Mm -hmm. Even when I had the Uller, I still had to keep it under 70. Cause I'm like, and you know how I'm super wow. sensitive that I have to be all cold. I can let the house go 72, 73 degrees. No problem. I actually haven't tested to go higher. I keep going up and up. And I, I tested it. You got So I went up to 80 and then I had to go back down to 78. That is hot. <laughs> in my so house. what's the That's difference? So what's the difference? Why is this one better? Like, is it the power it's, of it? It's like a, a Ferrari engine versus the, oh. the Honda. Is it a lot engine. louder? No. It's super quiet. quiet. It's quieter. Wow. Smaller of a unit. It, that's what I mean. It's just luxury wise, like the, the little bit more you spend for it, it's it's worth the money in spades. Not only that, I don't know how far you are with yours or not, but my, my app is up and rolling now. Oh, good. So it's adjusting to me, AI. So it figures out what makes you get the best sleep. Yes. Wow. So it's measuring my rem, my rem. Now my, you have to like it just does it for you. you it does. Don't I don't touch. I don't touch it. It, it. It's measuring my rem and deep sleep, and movement and you know, total sleep, 
and Learning. where and where I yeah where I started at, and then it optimizes it through the night. And I was actually just last night I was kind of playing with it and manipulating because I stayed up later, and so I was like, oh, I don't want it to because it will it'll it's I have it at minus seven is where I start, and then by the time I hit my I think it's my deep sleep. It, it brings me back up to like my, and it says, because I guess once you get into your REM, because I know we've always talked about like being really cold is optimal yeah. for best sleep. But I guess once you get to a certain state, it isn't necessarily being super cold, oh. like falling asleep and helping you get. But in. this is individualized. Yeah. So it's, it's figuring it out. For yeah. You. It's customizing wow. to, to, to me. And then it, yeah. So then it, it, le it gets to a, uh, it comes up, levels off, and then it heats up to wake me up. And then it also has a, a vibrating mechanism. So you don't need to use an alarm. I don't use an alarm anymore. Dude, I need that. So it sets up, I set it up. I'm going to set mine up because I sleep, the baby sleeps in our room and my alarm, I literally put it under the pillow to try and muffle it, but it has to be loud enough to wake me up. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah, you could and you could adjust the the level of the vibration. So you can make it real mild. So if you if you're a light sleeper and you just need a little bit of this kind of like vibration feeling and that would like subtly wake you up. Or if you need like a like really <laughs> wake you up. So like I've messed with yeah. It's I need sick, dude. It's I mean, this thing is this Justin thing is ben real. Needs to shake the and it gets so I'm the fine. thing that the the thing about the the Uller um was I had to I had to start it way earlier than I get in. I, I would need to get the temperature all the way down to the bottom 55 degrees before I got in it for it to neutralize my body oh. temperature so I would have a good night's sleep. The eight sleep, I can like forget to turn it on or whatever, even though it's programmed now, or I get to bed, let's say earlier than when it's kicked on to go. And I could get in it and it'll still cool me down. And when I was first learning what temp I want to be at, like I would wake up cold, like in the middle of the night where it would get my body so so cold the other night it was so funny I Katrina got so mad at me so I was sleeping and like naturally I, my side got so cold that I flipped to the other side and I rolled over I rolled over and I scooted my butt against her and how cold my skin was woke her up <laughs> you're naked you're naked yeah. cold ass butt <laughs> I she, forgot you sleep naked. Yeah, dude. So she got she got so bad. Like, do you she, sleep? Do you she sleep yelped. naked when you guys share a room? When you and Justin share? No, I, right? No, I should hope not. Dude. Hell, hell yeah, I don't I do. look. Hey, hell, hell, hell yeah, yeah I do. does he, he, he does, does his he, thing. I do my. Yeah, you get under the covers yeah. and they just throw your underwear out. Yeah, dude. I can't yeah. sleep with clothes on. Wait, you sleep naked? I go down to my chummies. I sleep. I don't give a fuck who's in the room. I'm sleeping naked. Damn, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know what I'm doing now? Don't ever climb into bed with me, dude. Don't say you'll be fine. Feel as cold butt cheeks. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm doing? Put up a divider, bro. I cannot sleep with anything. On. I like so. Me, if the where'd that come from? That's a good question. When did you start doing that? You, not until I was probably in in high school or so. I think what ha I remember, I used to always sleep with like basketball basketball shorts on. <laughs> okay. And then I think one time I slept naked, and I just realized how much better sleep I got not being. I hate. I move from the side to back. So like, you hate it when the yeah. shorts get yeah twisted. they get oh. twisted up. You gotta wear the tight shorts like me, bro. Yeah, but then I feel like I'm, my stuff can't breathe. Yeah, yeah it needs to breathe. Yeah, yeah. You said yeah. Bre I need to breathe. I just, yeah, I just picture just, breathing. Yeah, I need to, I need to breathe. <laughs> so. You gotta use an inhaler. Yeah, I, 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 I've tried. I've tried sleeping. I mean, I guess like the, the most comfortable Get real light. I have some real lightweight. <laughs> Like uh, sh shorts that if I have those on, so, I, I can get through. You know it. what I'm a dude, dude? Because we, st we stay somewhere and we're in rooms. Doug and I always room, and you and Justin always room. Because we're polar I'm, bears. Hey, I'm gonna fucking wait till we're asleep. I'm gonna tell you ahead of time, so when it happens, you're not mad. You'll still get mad. I'm gonna bang the shit out of your door and scare you, so you have to get up. So Justin gets to watch your naked ass <laughs> <laughs> right up to the front door. No. Hurry up! <laughs> you don't even know it. I'm walking around there naked all the time. You know, he has no idea. Yeah, he has no Dang. idea. Yeah, he just, <laughs> he's a heavy sleeper. I'm, glad I'm a heavy sleeper. Yeah, he's a heavy. Yeah. Sleeper. What do you do to him while he's sleeping? <laughs> yeah, I clench my butt cheeks a little harder. No, next, no. Next time no. Sleep. <laughs> that's disgusting. <laughs> that's why Justin got pink eye. Oh, <laughs> anyway, oh, all right, that's far, enough. That's enough. Far, wow. Hey, so listen, I want to talk about. <laughs> I want to talk about a common exercise that um, I really, I emphasized a portion of this exercise because of the conversation that we had with Brent Contreras. So we had him on the show. Great episode, by the way. If you haven't checked that out, check it out. Um, good stuff. And he was talking about studies that show, and we're familiar with these studies, that show that the, the greatest hypertrophy gains within a rep come from the stretch portion of a rep. Now, that doesn't mean the other, I want to be clear, it doesn't mean the other portions of the rep, like the squeeze and the mid part, don't right. build muscle, but it the all stretch tributes, but yeah. but the stretch portion seems to have these special muscle building effects. 
So what I've been doing is I've been doing exercises and seeing if I can emphasize that portion of the rep just to see what happened. Do you know what exercise, if you angle your body right, is phenomenal for a stretch in the pecs besides flies? Dips. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, bro. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You get your elbows out and you sink down. Now, you yeah. got to make sure you stay tense. So people trying this, don't just relax at the bottom. You hurt your shoulder. But man, I could go down and I could stretch across the pecs like mm -hmm. nothing else. And so I've been doing them that way. And I've always done deep dips, but now yeah. I'm like really focusing on the stretch. Holy cow. That exercise is that, like a whole yeah, other Yeah, no, I, could, I totally went through that whole process when I was like first learning to stabilize on the rings and then trying you have to, to grind up from the bottom. You just, you have to go so slow and incremental, like, because it's put so much demand you know, on your, your muscles to stabilize and isometrically hold. But once you get that depth, oh my God, like everything lit up so much more once I went back to the bench press. It was crazy. So I have an interesting journey on, uh, you know, building my, my chest used to be one of my weakest points. I, I had not only was it weak, I've talked about it before. I had a hard time even feeling it. I had one side that there was a, a huge discrepancy from the left to the right. Like it was a very, very difficult muscle for me to develop when I first started lifting. I saw huge benefits when I first started to actually shortening my range of motion up to 90 degrees. And I think that had to do with just the, the technique of keeping it in my chest and not allowing my shoulders and my arms to get in it. So my first big leap was actually stopping at 90 degrees. And then of course, like we've done so many times, I became this massive advocate back then in my early twenties of like stopping at 90 degrees. Like I used to tell people that, oh, once you go deeper this, then your shoulders and arms take yeah, over and like- gonna bounce it off. Yeah, so yeah. I, I would sell that so hard because it made such a massive difference for me. Then later on, and then I get in the full range of motion kick and then I, became, I, be, I started to train in it. And then I saw another huge leap with it. So I do think there's like value to to utilizing both to understanding like where you're at in that journey with that. And I think it had something to do with the my inability to activate the chest. And so then getting in this really stretched position, I felt the shoulders and arms and then they would kick into the move early on, right? When I first started. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't feel the great benefits of it. When I shortened the range of motion up, I had a better time isolating the chest in the movement. Mm -hmm. And so now I learned how to connect better to it. Then once I learned to connect then better, go. then I could go really Great deep point. and stay connected. And then I got huge benefits from that. So uh, if someone's listening to this and you struggle with that, that was, I, that's I, a great, that's a great sequence of uh, like a process. Yeah. It was when I, I now, obviously now I can unpack that going through it. Yeah. It was a struggle and frustration, not understanding. Like it was like conflicting, like, wait a second. Right. I thought this was the only way to do it. And then I went that way and then I saw great benefits from it. But I, what I think now, when I look back was it had a lot to do with my inability to really connect to that muscle. And so the really deep range of motion, I was utilizing all the other secondary muscles mm -hmm. more than really using, using my chest, shortening it up so I could isolate helped. And then when I went back, so glad like, you said this, cause someone might not understand that go straight to this deep range of motion, not connect and be like, I don't notice anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. All right. I have a shout out. So it's not a typical shout out, but if you're interested in this in the kind of therapy that I talked about, I look, I think the therapist is all the difference. I know ketamine makes a big difference, but the therapist it's like a trainer working with tools to help you get leaner. The trainer is the integral part. The person I work with, um, I don't, I'm, obviously it's one person, so she can't work with everybody, but she may be able to direct you. Her name is Harmony Stone, but Harmony spelled H A R M O N I E. So not Y, it's I E and then Stone, just like it sounds S T O N E. She's in San Jose, very easy Google, Harmony Stone, San Jose. And if you message her, say you heard about her from mind pump and then either she'll be able to help you or direct you in the right direction. Cause I'm not super versed in where to go with this kind of stuff, but I trust her. She's phenomenal. And she's, uh, she's like, again, she's very good at what she do, does. Look, children's multivitamins are really just glorified candy, gummy candies. Well, there's a company called Haya that believes in making real multivitamins for children, adequate nutrients that are delivered properly. That aren't a bunch of sugar filled crap. Check them out. Multivitamins for kids backed by Mind Pump. Go to HayaHealth.com. That's H-I-Y-A health.com forward slash Mind Pump. And with that link, you'll get 50% off your first order. All right, back to the show. First question is from Pia Robles Fit. What do you guys think about the Arnold press? Many people say it's a waste of time. It's the best shoulder press dumbbell variation, in my opinion. It gives you the greatest range of motion. 
um, where a traditional shoulder press, because the hands are facing forward, it's really hard to get like a super full range of motion. The Arnold press, which was obviously invented by Arnold, he would rotate his hands so he could come all the way down to the front and get this real full range of motion. It's, it's one of my favorite shoulder presses for everything, muscle development, function, stability, everything. Yeah, not to mention that the shoulder is is like this floating joint that has its ability has the ability to rotate so to mm. it doesn't move in this just like that rigid yeah. plane so i mean and i know justin uh, before he even gets oh to this God. is going to be super pro that i mean he likes all the this is half my inclusions of all the programs <laughs> right is like, anything spiral rotation? or rotation for joints that are designed to do that and so if anything, it's uh, more of a waste of time or worse to do things like standard military press or strict press movements because the shoulder is just not designed to move like that. So, and it's not that I wouldn't do a shoulder press or strict press movements like that are, are great, but there's no way that I'm not also training some sort of a rotational component in there like an Arnold press or some sort of a kettlebell press or a movement that incorporates the full range of motion and a rotational component in it. I think- Whoever said this is an idiot. Oh, yeah. Just go ahead and ask one of those people that say it's a waste of time to reach up and, and, and grab, you know, a, a can of soup uh, <laughs> from their cupboard for you. Yeah. You know, and like, watch that. See, see how that goes. It's just like, it, it's silly to me. Like, and I, and I think, well, and this is kind of where I guess the functional side gets qualms about like some of the hypertrophy side of the world where we're always trying to just get into these positions where you could feel more squeeze. And, you know, I don't know if that's exactly where it's coming from, but a lot of these like shortened kind of reps, like you can feel a little more muscle tension. And, uh, and so people will probably abandon like things with rotation or like more functional type, uh, full range of motion exercises, but there's so much value to it just for everyday life and strength overall in general and the health of your shoulder that it's like it's that's a stupid i do i i actually fought this back when i was a competitor because the idea that the the shortened military press was better for shoulder development than this full range of motion arnold press or having a there's uh, zero bullshit or well, debunk I saw, that yeah. i saw way more development by taking the shoulder through the floor not to mention and i won't sell out the people that we've experienced this with but I remember when we were doing all of our programs, Justin creates all those and has to shoot all of them. And we have programs that are kind of bodybuilder focused or, uh, and we'd have exercises where uh, you just have to do like an uh, overhead tricep extension with yeah. dumbbell behind your head. And some of these really fit trainers uh, that looked awesome couldn't even do an overhead extension because they had no range of motion in their shoulders, no, this no shoulder mobility whatsoever. And, but yet their shoulder caps look cool. Well, that's what happens when you do 90 degree shoulder presses only, and you don't take it through full range of motion and address the rotational yeah, component look, of it. Sometimes there's a little bit of substance behind that. Well, I'm keeping tension on the muscle and it's better for hypertrophy. And sometimes there's, there could be a case, there could be some logic behind it. In this particular situation, though, there's zero argument. It's a fuller range of motion, so it's better for fun functionality. It's a fuller range of motion, so it's better for muscle development. It doesn't take out the squeeze. The squeeze is still at the top. Doesn't mm -hmm. take out tension either. It doesn't take out tension. In fact, there's more tension throughout a fuller range of motion. It's a better muscle building exercise from an aesthetic standpoint. It's better for functionality, mm -hmm. for shoulder function. It's better all the way around. If I had to pick, by the way, I don't think anybody should only pick one exercise, okay? So I'm not making that argument. But if I could only pick one overhead press, yeah. it would be an Arnold press. Yeah. Just hands down for you know, all you of know the what, you know through who, all of those, the, 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 the different functions of the shoulder. Like right. It covers you know what, all this, of it. This is just like someone saying that barbell deep squats are a waste of time because as long as you hack squat or you leg press. Yeah. That's what this is like saying. Same, it's the same. And you know why someone would say this? Because it's hard. That's the reason why people <laughs> you are do not, it. You, uh, you could go military now, now press into the root of 225, it, yeah. but good luck taking like Arnold press dumbbells with 100 pound dumbbells. You or, know what or what, yeah. Typically happens is people will press at 90 degrees with dumbbells for years. Then they'll go to an Arnold press and it hurts their shoulder. Yeah. Oh mm -hmm. no, that hurts my shoulder. Well, it hurts your shoulder because there's communication between the humerus and the scapula and there's things that have to happen in the shoulder and you've never trained those properly. So you add a little bit of load and you get hurt as yeah. a result. This actually happened to me recently. I actually, uh, for a second, 
stopped doing these full range of motion exercises and was doing a lot of isolation shoulder exercises, went back to shoulder presses and found they hurt when I went yeah. all the way down all of a sudden at this point in my training career. And I said, oh yeah, never again. And I got no benefit, by the way, from messing around with the isolation stuff. Yeah. I, I got a good pump, but I didn't get more muscle. There's, there's literally no argument for why another shoulder press is better than this one. Now, there's other exercises you could do that have different benefits. But when it comes to presses, these full range of motion, you know, varieties like an oral press is just, they're superior. Next question is from Meg's Daily Wellness. How much of a calorie surplus should I be in for minimal fat gain, but maximum muscle gain? God, this is very individual. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. I'll give some general answers. Specific here. number, please. Yeah. I'll give some individual, some general answers, answers, I should say, but there's, there's such a huge variance. So I would say if I'm training a woman and I want her to gain muscle with minimum fat gain, and I'm doing good workout programming, because that's the key. If I have shitty workout programming, a surplus will just turn into fat. Okay. So good workout program, good recovery, good muscle building signal, good sleep. Everything's great. I'm going to keep it around 300 calories. Okay. For men, it's closer to 500 calories. That's generally speaking. Now, if I'm, I've worked with people where, I mean, we had a caller like this the other day, mm -hmm. young kid who bumped his calories by like 800 and was barely gaining any weight. And then I've worked with people where we go above 150 calories and we start to see a little fat gain. So there is a big variance, but the, the generally speaking, that's typically what I would. Well, yeah, before uh, Adam goes into elaborate uh, <laughs> detail here, because this is his world. Uh, one thing I've noticed with a lot of people is that they're just, they don't really understand like their maintenance. Like they don't even have that down yet in terms of like, they haven't yeah. gone through all the work of tracking and like seeing trends in like the entire week, the entire month, the, like in terms of their overall habits, like of, of their eating patterns and their movement. So to, to have an accurate account just for your maintenance to begin with, to then venture off and like know what that number even looks like, I think is a good place to start. So when I bump calories for both men and women, it typically is a 200 to 500 range or a 500 and a thousand range. And the way I decide that is based off of what they tend to struggle with. If I have a, a, a female client or a male client who have a really hard time gaining, like the, the young man that we were talking about, I'm going to lean on the higher side, 500 for women, a thousand for men. If I have a client who's like really nervous to add calories because they feel like they gain weight really easy, I'm only going to bump her like 200 to 250 calories. I'm only going to bump him like 400 to 500 calories. That's literally how I do it. It's if you are concerned that you're going to put on too much body fat because you gain weight easily and you don't have a problem eating lots of calories, then I'm going to just incrementally move you up. If you struggle with gaining, I'm going to push the boundaries a little bit. Sure. As simple as that. And, sure. and, and the only reason why the male or female thing is different is because most men are concerned consuming on average, say 2,500 to 3,500 minimum calories, sometimes as high as that one young man, which was 4,000. Most women are somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 calories. So it's really a percentage of their total amount and just a generic number. Like I said, two to two to 500 range on the low end, 500 to 1,000 range on the high end. I'm leaning on the high end when you struggle with putting weight on. I'm on the low end when you don't have a problem with putting weight on. Now, by the way, the 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 science math that people will try to apply that is is, is not- uh, You're overthinking it. Yeah, like they'll, mm -hmm. be, they'll say something like, but a pound of muscle is only yeah, yeah. Hmm. this many grams of protein, this many calories, and a pound of fat is only this many. So actually to gain a pound of muscle per two weeks, you only need to be in a surplus of- 60 calories. It doesn't work that way because <clears throat> the cal the calories do a lot more than just go directly to muscle building. They also fuel the extra strength, the extra volume, the extra recovery. And then there's a lot of things we don't know. So the numbers we're giving is based off of our experience because yeah, you could go and I could dissect a pound of muscle, a pound of fat, and I could say, oh, you want to gain three pounds of muscle in a month? Well, that only is going to break down to you know 73.7 calories and it doesn't work that way. There's also, I mean, whenever we give advice, not only do we take into account the science and the research and our experience, we also factor in behavioral. And behaviorally speaking, the kid who has struggles with gaining weight tends to underestimate what he eats. So I'm going to push the estimation higher. The person who puts weight on so fast tends to underestimate the weight. So not only are we factoring in the science and our experience, we're also factoring in the behavior. That's how I've came up with those generic numbers. But typically, that works really well for people. Next one is from Jamie. Barbell squats. Is there a best way? Toes pointed straight forward or out? So long as you're not outside of 
uh, what would be considered a squat. In other words, you're not doing some weird, crazy form. Mm -hmm. Whichever one produces better yeah, form. Either or. Yeah. So like, like whichever one gives you better form and technique and stability is going to be the better version. Okay. That being said, if you really want to get into the squat, you really want to maximize the results. You really want to become a master at performing this incredibly important exercise. If you can only squat well with your toes pointed out, you should probably figure out why yes. you can't do it with them pointed forward and vice versa. You should be able to do all of them, yeah. or at least that should be the goal. But uh, the, the but to answer the question more directly, it's the 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 foot position that produces the best form and technique is going to be the best one for you. Yeah. I mean, that's always been my stance is like, you should be able to really be able to squat in multiple positions, your foot positions, uh, and then assess why there's restrictions if yeah. not. Right. Um, and, and if you're a competitive, uh, squatter and, and you're doing this, like you, obviously, uh, you're going to pay attention to what, um, you know, you feel most stable in and, you know, what feels like mechanically is the most sound for you individually. And that's the one that you want to reiterate and you, you want to build off of. And so, um, you know, that's something to pay attention to if you're going to be competitive about it. But if you're just trying to do this for overall health and strength and function, um, you know, you should challenge yourself with different foot positions. You should, uh, you know, do different uh, placements with the bars this is why it's like it's important to also cycle in, you know, front squats, uh, zerchers, like, you know, different different loading uh positions because life is full of variables and you have to be yeah. resilient towards all of it. So I agree. My favorite place to start with this, we did a video a long time ago. I don't know what the title of it is, but basically you, you lie on your back and you just bring oh, your knees up into your so chest. That's your squat position. And you, you'll see that your, your feet and your width, like, so you, you naturally come into a position that will probably be most comfortable for you to squat in everything from, you'll see your feet, will either rotate out a tiny bit or they'll stay neutral. Who was it that you did that with? Uh, like, you mean like who? You were in the video. I think he might have actually performed oh, I did the it. video. Yeah. I, you guys did it. It was back when we used to do the videos oh. at, that one, at that one. It's a long time ago. So yeah, this is like- You were the one that- We were there watching him. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a, yeah, yeah. You know what it reminded me, and I can't remember who taught me, so I wish I could credit whoever it was, but it was just a, a real good- generic way to find a starting one. You, you know, if you've ever uh, snowboarded or wakeboarded or with that and you've, you're teaching someone, they're like, am I regular or goofy? We used to do this thing where you put them on the edge of the boat. You don't tell them, we push them. Oh, you push them. Yeah. yeah. You, you don't tell them and That's you shove hilarious. them. And then they'll naturally it. step with their lead foot. Yeah. And so you, now you know like, oh, you should lead Oh, it. weird. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't train goofy and go the other way. It's just that naturally That's your priority. You'll, you'll step. Oh, so my left is lead then. I just thought about it right now. So you'll step out with whatever someone shoves oh, you when you're not paying attention. You like jump off when you're doing layups. Well, or, that's not what I'm, I'm not going to do it either. So the same <laughs> thing goes for this squat. Like there's, this isn't like, this, this isn't like, oh, perfect exactly how ever it's like it's just a good what's it called how to find your natural squat stance yeah. 2016 we recorded it yeah it's an old wow, one that's right? old school. yeah so this this is yeah, a really cool <laughs> this is a really cool yeah i was buff and had hair like you might not even recognize me. who's the other guy with me. mine why pump? does justin and doug look younger today yeah. they're doing something <laughs> yeah. to us adam something's we happening. started fatter and then but, we kind of worked our way down so that's how i would take a client who was asking this question or couldn't figure out where we should start i would i would put them down like that i would uh, tell them to bring their knees in i would look at and assess oh their their feet are about you know two feet apart i notice they're slightly externally rotated that's how i want you to squat but to justin's point I want to eventually sumo squat with you. I eventually want to narrow stance squat with you. I want to be able to open your stance up. I want to be able to try and get as close to neutral as we can with it. I want to elevate your heels and do tippy toe squats. Like I want to be able to squat your body in all different positions totally. with the foot and ankle and get you comfortable with that. But to start... Uh, and learn the mechanics and get good at it. I think this is a really good generic way to to get someone where they should be. Next question is from Spud Stridum. How would you say your relationship with your wives changed through their pregnancy and after having kids? I'm cert uh, super excited for my husband and I to be moving forward towards that phase, but also nervous about how things may change. Oh boy. Oh, I would. Uh, they so will change. I think they would. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> I didn't think about that, bro. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. I was just about to say, hey, I think everything's for the positive. And then you yeah. say some shit like that. Okay, well, we're all going to have different experiences for sure, so it'll be interesting to hear everybody go here. But me personally, uh, this was incredible for me uh, in, in every aspect, uh, physically, emotionally, purpose. Like, my relationship completely changed with Katrina. I thought I loved her before. 
Um, I thought I had purpose before watching her get pregnant. It was already starting to change a little bit. Having our son and then watching her with our son, it completely changed. Um, it changed my love for her for sure. It's like on a whole other scale, uh, how I look at her. And I'm so much more, I'm attracted to her, her body, the way it looks, I'm uh, physically I'm drawn to her more post pregnancy, uh, than I was the, when we met when we were 29 and 30 years old. So it's been uh, an amazing experience. I just, you know, yeah, they're they're raising a, a little version of you. There's a, they're, you're now connected in a different way than you, like you can do all the therapy and reading together and, 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 and building a, a connection to each other. But when you create a, a living thing, Together, it it bonds you like nothing else could possibly bond. And that's not to take away from anybody who doesn't want to have children with their uh, with their partner and stuff like that. I don't want to try. This isn't like me trying to shame you or anything like that. It's like, but you know, because that's coming from someone who almost didn't have kids. The connection that it builds, uh, there's nothing that you can compare to because you've created a life with that person, and so it's done nothing for me, but, uh, but positive things on, on all levels, I would say. Yeah. I'll, I'll start with what the, the data says, and then I'll talk about my personal experience. So the data shows, um, there's a big fork in the road with relationships in this and things either become stronger and the bond becomes stronger or, uh, the stress and the anxiety and the new circumstances can become overwhelming, uh, for a couple. And I think that they're both closely connected. I think the more challenging something is with your partner and you have this kind of common focus, it could cause either way, right? It can make things go bad or go good or both simultaneously. Like first I have four kids and for sure each one added a new level of stress, added new challenges. It always does. You're, you're, you're caring for things that are more important to you than you than yourself. You're also placed under a lot of stress because of lack of sleep and bills and scheduling and kids are, um, you know, it's like you're, you're living with little tyrants sometimes or, you know, they just don't, they don't consider other people's feeling their kids, right? So it can make things really hard. Um, but then on the other end, um, you love something more than anything in the world. And then there's this other person that also does. And so no matter what, you guys have this, this crazy bond, okay? Um, this, is, um, this is a very powerful thing. Now, for me personally, uh, I first of all, there's a reason why moms get so much um, respect from people. The, the sacrifice you make as a father is a lot. You make huge sacrifices yeah. if you're involved and you work and you dedicate yourself to raising your kids. But let's be honest, moms sacrifice everything. They sacrifice their bodies. They sacrifice their sanity, their hormones. Like they, they, they literally sacrifice themselves uh, during and after pregnancy. Um, like, I, I mean, I watched my wife go through this and um, it was a whole different level of respect and mm -hmm. awe. And even, even now, like she can be so sleep deprived and feeling so terrible. And then when it comes to the kids, she's just ready to, she'll kill herself for them willingly. And I'm like, this is, uh, absolutely insane. So it definitely increased the amount of obstacles and challenges that my wife have to overcome. But I have a connection and a bond with her um, now that I don't think was possible before. But I, I'd be lying if I didn't say, prepare yourself for what's to come because you're a, you don't realize how selfish you are until you have kids. And then you're like, oh shit, I'm living for something else. That by itself is a massive challenge and you are either going to grow and become a far better version of yourself or you're not and it's going to cause a uh, big problem. So that's the, that's what you have to be prepared for. I remember when I trained older clients, I used to love asking them about raising kids and marriage. And I remember they would say things to me. There was this older couple that I trained and I'm like, man, you guys been married for, I don't remember how it was like 60 or 70 years. And, um, I said, what's it like? And I said, well, it's really hard. I said, well, I always hear that. Everybody says it's hard. Like, what do you mean? And they said, oh, there was like a, God, there was like a four year period where, man, it was really rough. And I'm like, four years? Yeah. Like four years? And they said, well, yeah, but we've been married for, I don't remember what it was. It was like 65 years. We raised these kids. We have great grandkids and grandkids. They said, that's life, you know? And I, I remember like being just 
blown away. My, most people, like a lot of people aren't even in relationships that are four years long, let alone going through a four year period of, of challenge. Um, and the, the first, I think it's the first two years that a child after a child is born is the hardest. That's when you see most challenges, but then you kind of come out of it and you really start to, you can really strengthen things. So you know, that's what's to expect. And if you're both in it, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but that, but if you're both in it, you'll, you'll, you'll make it and you'll come out strong. Yeah. I mean, all those things. I think, I think, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I say things tongue in cheek, but really at the end of the day, it's, it, there's challenges, but there's so many benefits and, and they far outweigh the challenges and, and the challenges are there to know whether or not, um, you know, you, you have that person, that, that, that teammate, that, that person you can count on, rely on and have that deep bond with. Uh, and this is really like what you find out is just, you know, what your partner's willing to go through and, and, um, you know, the level, uh, that you guys can grow together. And, and so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's challenging and in, in different stages, you know, through the whole thing. So it's, uh, it's not like it, all ro like there's a lot of rosy periods and then there's periods where it's like difficult. So even, even having kids like one kid versus the other kid yeah. and, like, and then the difference there. And, the, and so for us, it was like, yeah, we had that like awesome, like amazing, like everything is, is, um, you know, going so well. And, and yes, we're, we're sleep deprived and all this stuff, but then this, you know, we had, complications and problems with, with, you know, the second pregnancy and, and, and then it turned into like this, um, situation where like hormones shifted and changed. And so now it just kind of created all new variables that we had to consider. And now like our relationship and, you know, all these things, but, you know, through all of that, like solidifies this, this incredibly strong, incredibly powerful, uh, bond and, and love, um, uh, going forward. So, yeah, it's not like um, it's a small thing. I guess is my point. <laughs> you know, uh, can you name anything more? No, it's it's challenging. It's it's amazing. No, nothing. Nothing has been more challenging, and also, um, I guess, beneficial in my life. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Well, I mean, you care about something more than yourself. I I, I can't say that about anything else. You yeah. know, so you know the 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 Bible only says one thing about choosing a partner. You know what it says? No. Choose someone that you would go to war with. Wow. Mm. Wow. That's so. Perfectly said. I picked the right person. I would make this joke about Jessica, but if shit went down, I definitely she would get us both thrown in the gulags and we'd be in there together. You know? <laughs> She'd be with me there getting tortured. Yep. Yeah, that's for sure. And I and I think uh, I mean a lot of the like listen, you guys go around your experience. I think a lot has to do too, like where um, where you're at in your life. Like <clears throat> you know, you you talk about how selfless it is to be a parent. Um, I, I I probably wouldn't have the experience even with Katrina. I wouldn't have the same experience if I had it at say twenty five, because at that period of my life I was very much so. It, you had to go look, go through some shit. Yeah, I was very selfish. Yeah. Not not to mention all the stuff I was still unpacking and working yeah. on from my my childhood stuff that I needed to get through. So where you're currently at in your 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 individual journey probably has a lot to do with what your parenting and relationship journey is going to be like. And so luckily when <clears throat> we decided to have a kid, I was prepared for sacrifice. I was, I was ready in my life to live it for somebody else. Like I didn't, mm -hmm. like I had already, like I literally felt like, okay, I checked all the boxes. Like I'm done. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've checked all the selfish boxes I really wanted to do. And so I was completely okay with sacrificing all those things that I did for myself. And I was truly going into it, like excited to make sacrifices. So if you go in, I think like, like wanting that or knowing that's coming, you're probably going to have a whole different experience than going in thinking it's going to be all just love and roses and easy because you're going to go through that. Yeah. You're going to go through like, Oh wow. I didn't realize how much I wanted that, or I thought I needed that. And now I can't have that or can't do that. And that I think tends to be a major struggle for a lot of people that, and which is also why I think it's tough the younger you are, because much of that experience, especially for men, we're kind of figuring that out in our teens and twenties of like uh, sometimes thirties. Yeah. And sometimes even thirties, depending on how much of a Peter Pan syndrome that we have. So it, I think everyone's experience is going to be so unique mm -hmm. and, and, and different. Um, have you guys, did you guys ever remember, do you remember getting any really good, I, I got some advice that was really good a few years ago 
from a friend of mine. I won't, I, I mentioned him before, but I don't know if I want to mention his name now, but he, he's, he's like a, a mentor to me. And, um, he said, um, you know, cause if you, if you think about the experience between the, the, the man and the woman through pregnancy, like nothing physically changes for the man. I mean, or at least nothing's forcibly changing on me. Like, you know, whether she's month two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to birth, like I'm the same, like nothing's happened. Her body is radically different, radically, not a little bit different, way different. Everything from hormones to physical, the physical body to the experience in the world. And it's in a very short period of time. You look at a woman month one, nothing's physically changing, but there's a lot of stuff changing on the inside month nine. They don't look the same at all. Like it's, it's crazy. So what he told me is he said, you know, and you know, I thought this was good advice is he said, um, your job is to be the rock in the storm. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, she's going through all kinds. You won't even, you, you can't even comprehend the changes that she's going through. Your job is to be that stable rock through the storm, calm, strong, and secure. And then for the wife, if this is you with your spouse and you're going through it and they're providing this for you, the best thing I can tell you from a husband's perspective or the, the male's perspective is to occasionally in the middle of the storms, let him know, I appreciate how solid you've been during this time, or I really appreciate how you've been the rock during this time. And all that's going to do for the man is make him feel like he's willing to drag himself across glass. Yeah, the respect thing, that attachment out hundred percent. You know, after we had attachment out it made me connect more things to why I think uh, I, why I was so much more drawn to Katrina after the kid is, you know, he, t what do you say? Uh, women, uh, the oxytocin, right? So and the, we are, um, uh, uh, yeah, what's the chemical? Vasopressin. Yeah. Vasopressin. Vasopressin. Yeah. And vasopressin is closely related to like goal setting and accomplishing yes, some yes. of that. And so, you know, I, I, I would pick this partner who I would go to war with, who I, I love attacking goals with. We have the biggest goal of our life now. We have a child we have to raise in this crazy world. And so uh, I think that filled that like I've never felt before. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really rewarding thing, especially for a man that you get when you have a child. And if you have a, a partner like this who is excited to to uh, grow and, and, and raise a child in this world, there's a lot of thought that goes into, you know, how are we going to educate this kid and how are we going to deal with tech and how are we going to communicate around them and what things are we going to teach them and um, I didn't realize that how much of that I was going to get fulfillment from. Mm -hmm. And after obviously you know, hearing Adam talk about those things, I now have made that connection of like, oh, wow, that's why. You know, what's crazy too um, is uh, you guys know this as parents. You could think you could hate somebody, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about spouse or partner, but you could look at somebody like they annoy me. But if they genuinely care about your kids and care for your kids, you can't help but somehow like them or at least respect them, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could have a family member or friend, you're like, God, I hate that person. But then you see them with your kids <laughs> and they're really involved and they really care. And it's like, oh, they oh it's helped to repair and restore relationships with family members yes. that like I've, I've been removed from and had- Because yeah. they love your kids. Yeah, because they're just all bought into your kids and you're like, oh, wow. And so it, like- it, a, It's a, like a bridge. Like my example. So I had, you know, obviously I was married before and I have an ex- And there's reasons why we got divorced. So obviously we're not like, hey, we're best friends. Like <laughs> this was a reason for it. But we had some really challenging uh, times with my kids that we share. And it brought my, myself, my wife, and my ex-wife together. Mm. Because now the person I respect most in that is my wife because it's not her biological kid. But through me, she's, I mean, this is something that Jessica, like she'll always, she'll have my respect for the rest of my life no matter what she does because of how she cares for my kids that are not even hers. Like that right there, no matter what, she could do anything. I'll always value that. But it brought the three of us. You would think what a crazy combination, ex-wife, wife, husband, you know. We came together and we've maintained this relationship because of some of these challenges that, you know, raising these kids have brought. And nothing, nothing would have done that. There would have been nothing else that would have done that other than this, like, these children that we all care about. It's well, pretty remarkable. If yeah. you've listened to the show long enough, um, you probably heard me years ago uh, complain a lot about the ch the number one challenge Katrina and I had in our relationship was her family. Oh, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't, it was the, it was cause the most fights in our relationship. It was a consistent w work that I had to do on myself in those moments. Like I just, 
with every bone in my body resisted all this family stuff they had to do all the time, all the time. And it was hard. It was really hard for me. And yeah, like you had all your weekends were taken up with. <laughs> oh man, it was, a, it was a lot of work and it's crazy yeah. to see what a 180 has happened since we've had a kid. Like now all of that stuff that I, I, I had a challenge with so much, I value so much and appreciate and love now, which is so wild because for me. I love your kid. Yeah. And they, and the support yeah. that comes with that of raising a child and community. And I have friends and family that don't have that. And I see how hard it is for them yeah. and like how blessed Katrina and I have the ability, by the way, this is on a, on this note of like tip, like it's so important when you go through this journey of raising a kid that you never lose sight of each other as the, the is the most important first. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's why you hear this generic advice all the time. Oh, date night. And things yeah, like yeah, that yeah. is so important that you continue to stay united and connected because it's really easy to also, to, because it is so overwhelming to raise children to just like, you know, divide and conquer. Yeah. And it's like, oh, lose you take sight your, of each other. Yeah. And lose sight of each oh, other yeah. and delegate all the things that need to be done. Half the friction. I mean, even just in my own experience of like having to do two different jobs at different time periods. So it like, she was like in the night shift. And so we were like two ships in the night, like every day. And just like, oh, you got this, I got this. And then it just was, I mean, inevitably that's just going to crumble. So yeah, yeah th thankfully, you know, things changed and then we were able to repair that. But yeah, that's that's a huge thing. to. I think, I think it's one of the most common things that I see in relationships. Of course, it's like running a business. What do they say? Customer always comes first. Nuh uh If your staff is happy, your customers are happy. If you ignore the staff because you're always after the customer, nobody's going to be happy. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with raising your kids. Like take care of each other because we're leading this and we're working together and then we're going to be better parents. I just think it's a problem that is is worse, way worse today than it ever was before because we live in a time where yeah. Almost every household has a two income household. Yeah, you got to make it happen. Yeah, we're and then you add in the fact if you have more than one kid, you have two kids. Like, man, talk about a really, really hard time. And then you add in the fact if you don't have a close connection to your family, friend. Like, so I have a lot of close friends that I'm watching this happen. It's like, man, they got two or more kids. They don't have a lot of family support. They both got to work. It's like it's almost impossible. <laughs> For How them to that? find time for themselves yeah. like that. And that, and then you see the challenges that they're going through. And what I see from the outside looking in is, man, they have lost each other. And it's so important that you, you find a way to do that. And if you're lucky enough to have the resources, use those resources to continue to pour and, into and, each and, other. And know what to expect. I think media has sold marriage as either this boring, terrible thing, or as this joyful, we're always in love type of thing where the other person has to fulfill you and make it. That's not the job. Yeah. The job is not that it's not always going to happen. You have to work together. You're going to go through periods of depression. You're going to have periods of challenge. They're going to have periods of depression and challenge and anxiety and whatever, and poor health or whatever. You have to be able to get through all of that. So you're not going to have, it's not going to be like, Oh, roses and eat. it's going to be a lot of, but like, how great is it to know that no matter what happens to me, this person's there. They're not just there for me. They're there for my kids. Yep. Like, who else are you going to find like that? So that's the, I think that's the value. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our guides. We have fitness guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is at Mind Pump. Justin, I'm at Mind Pump to Stefano and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 